people that like play Pokemon about, you know, collect them all. I'm not a, you know, a, a technique hoarder. Hey everybody, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 270. Man, as I say those numbers, as they keep going up, it continues to blow my mind that I'm still here, I'm still doing this show, and that not only are people still listening, but more people are listening. That makes me feel good. Honestly, this is one of the best parts, not only of my job, but of my life. And today, we're joined by a great friend of mine, Mr. Paul Milholan. Some of you may remember Mr. Milholan from an episode just a couple weeks ago that involved a, what can we call it, a chat. He and I were in Atlantic City for an event. I know Mr. Milholan well as my Superfoot training partner. In fact, just a couple hours ago, he and I were training together. So I rushed back to get this done so we could get the editing done on this episode. The timing of it's kind of funny. I think you're going to like this one. Mr. Milholland is a great guy. He's become a good friend, and I know how much the martial arts means to him. I won't say any more. I'll let you form your own opinions after listening to this episode. So let's welcome him onto the show. Mr. Milholland, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. <laughs> Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little while. Yeah. Well, uh, listeners, you may recognize... Mr. Milholland, as someone who was on the air recently, we did a quick chat as we were driving back from New Jersey from Sifu Allen Goldberg's event, and I don't remember the episode number off that, but we'll link to it from the show notes. So usually, you know, usually we we get these kind of more structured conversations in before we have a guest on for other reasons, but that's just not the way it worked this time. We happened to be in the car and we debriefed. Yeah, it was it was a I had a fun time, so I'm looking forward to this. Well, good. Yeah, good. All right. Well, you know, it's a martial arts show. We're going to talk about martial arts, and and we need some context. We need some context for who you are and how martial arts became part of your life. So let's let's do that first. Why don't you go back? Tell us how you discovered martial arts, and you know, kind of what hooked you in. Uh, to be honest, I'm not I'm not too sure. I think I think my parents wanted me to do something to do because uh, I first started when I was around uh, seven and uh, it was funny cause I, I know you're kind of a hip hop head and uh, it reminded me of a quote from uh, Nas. He said, you know, you can be whatever you want to be when you're ready to be it. And uh, I definitely wasn't ready for the martial arts then. Uh, cause I, I met a friend there and me and him kind of just, uh, you know, we, we goofed off a lot and got in a lot of trouble. Uh, but <laughs> you know, um, those skills that, uh, you know, I learned at seven, uh, like the break falling in judo, we did a lot of that. And then, so when I was kind of mature enough to, to handle the martial arts, I actually retained the, some of the skills that I learned, uh, when I was real young. So that, that was kind of impressive, but yeah, I, I've been basically doing it my whole life started, like I said, around seven in this kind of judo slash like karate, uh, type mix. And, uh, the cool thing I liked about it was it was through the YMCA. And I know a lot of times people think that, you know, to have a good instructor or something that you need to, you know, go to a, a legit, you know, full-time school with a place. But, uh, you know, I couldn't talk highly of Mr. Susie, who was his name that, you know, just taught a couple nights a week out of the YMCA. So that, that was a great experience and, and, uh, you know, kind of off the beaten path. Cause like I said, most people would like to just, you know, go to a standalone spot. Hmm. We've had at least, I, I'm, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to leave anybody out, but I'm yeah. thinking of at least two guests we've had on the show who teach out of a YMCA. And I've known people over the years who have taught in some very strange places, you know, yeah. church basements, yep. um, outside in parks, you know, and, and not everybody's going to resonate with a, you know, really formal neon lit seven days a week kind of pro school. I mean, some people want that. Some people want something that's a little more subdued. Yeah. If that's the right word. Yeah. And actually that's, that's how I got my start uh, teaching full time also was uh, before I got my, my physical school. Uh, I was teaching at a community center, which I still do, uh, you know, once a week, you know, for people that, that want to, you know, train on a budget or just don't have the time because it's only uh, Monday nights. And uh, it's something that I still do to kind of, you know, give back. And, and whenever they have, uh, like, uh, they just had a 35-year 
uh, kind of anniversary thing that I did a, a demo for and, and uh, some free stuff. So yeah, it was, it was fun times. And, uh, you know, I, I still kind of, you know, do that once a week just to, you know, keep that, that going. Cause I, I do enjoy it. And it's a nice kind of break away from kind of regular teaching to go to a different spot and teach. Nice. Now, how did you make the transition from student to instructor? Uh, basically, uh, like I said, after I, I trained for uh, maybe a couple of years when I was seven, uh, I took a break, kind of did other things, uh, soccer, basketball, kind of your run of the mill American type stuff. Um, but then I, I went to a kind of a rough middle school and, uh, cause I'm from Willimantic and I know some people might've known it from, you know, like 10, 20 years ago, 60 minutes did a thing about, uh, my town calling it heroin town, which, you know, gave it a bad rap, but, uh, at the same time, there is kind of a, you know, epidemic going on with, with drugs and just kind of, you know, not nice stuff. I mean, I'm not talking bad about it. It's an awesome place. I'm, I'm really glad I, I grew up there, but at the same time, I'm not sure coating it saying it's something that is not. So, um, yeah, when I was about 13, uh, I realized, all right, I, I probably should pick up some, some self-protection skills. So, uh, I went back to the, the judo place, but at that time, my dad bought me the, I don't know if you remember, you know, Bruce Lee had that four volume set. They're really short books. Like one had like an orange cover, yellow cover, blue cover and whatever. And, uh, yeah, I picked up one of their books and, and basically it was like the first one, which was just street self-defense. So in all of it, he didn't do any fancy wrist locks or throws. It was mostly, you know, sidekick to the shin, hammer fist to the face and stuff like that. Kind of like what I guess you see at a, you know, Krav Maga type stuff nowadays. But so, you know, reading that book, uh, I kind of want to do more striking. So I, I was looking for, uh, you know, a little bit something else, which nowadays I, I love uh, joint locks and, and throws. So it's kind of interesting how, you know, you kind of bounce around with, with martial arts. You don't always have to, you know, have have one thing and, and that's it. So uh, anyways, uh, me and my buddy, because he was getting picked on, uh, we did uh, tie boxing first and it was at like a next to a college UConn and we were just kind of getting beat up we were 13 we we're getting beat up by uh you know 18 20 year olds 30 year olds there was really no structure to the class except for jump in the ring and keep your hands up so uh we decided you know that that wasn't our our cup of tea so then we went to to taekwondo and uh yeah at the time it was it was uh kind of perfect because the the school just started up we were just you know interested so basically to answer your question about how I started teaching was I was, uh, you know, this guy's first pretty much student and, uh, you know, me and my buddy just kind of gravitated to training and, and we didn't really have anything else going on at the time. So, you know, we were training four or five days a week, just, just straight and, uh, did that for a few years and then, you know, became black belt and then just, uh, started kind of trading, assisting for the fee cause, uh, you know, it was kind of, tough paying for it. So it was, uh, you know, kind of one of those old school, you know, you clean the toilets and teach and, and you get to train for free. That's how I started mm. teaching. Mm. Now you, you talked about during that, that gap when you stopped training that you were playing traditional American sports, basketball, et cetera. Yep. But when you started training again, it said you left all that entirely. And, and I, I just want to talk about that for a second. Cause that's such a transitional point. Anybody that's owned a school knows that by the time somebody hits, you know, it's usually somewhere between 10 and 12, kids will bail on martial arts. I mean, statistically, it happens all over the place all the time to pursue, you know, generally team sports that their friends are into. And I'm wondering if there's some some wisdom in there for school owners. Yeah, and I... I why... No, I, 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 I totally uh, you know, have that same issue that you just mentioned was, um, cause I guess my, maybe not niche or whatever you want to say is that I'm, I'm pretty good with kids. So, uh, you know, I have a young demographic majority, uh, speaking and, um, yeah, like you said, it's, it's weird. Cause like, I would assume it'd be a little bit later, like around teenagers that kids, you know, drop out, but I've been finding what you just mentioned around 10 or 11 where, uh, you know, they, they'll either, uh, you know, quit altogether or they'll just take a few months off, which, you know, I'm all, all about cross training and how, you know, one thing helps another, but it, it's tough when, you know, you have students that you've just seen progress and grow into great people. And then 
you know, they just disappear because of this, that, and the third. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. And maybe if you have any, you know, insight, because I don't, I just kind of say, oh, you know, uh, you'll be missed and, you know, hopefully we'll see you soon. Or, you know, I just try and say, listen, you don't have to train every day. You know, even if you just make it once a week, just to kind of keep your foot in the door, because I know how easy it is to once you stop doing something, you know, for for it to get back. Because, you know, I used to be really big in the lifting weights a few years back, and I was, you know, really cut and, and stuff like that. And then I just, you know, this, that, and the third, whatever excuse, I, I stopped. And it's been real tough, uh, you know, getting that routine back. Mm. Well, a, a short time ago, maybe, I'm trying to remember when that was. Let's let's call it a year because okay. it, was, it was more than a couple months. Uh, I did an, an episode, uh, Sensei Jared Wilson and I from Marshall Thoughts had a chat about and I don't remember if this, if our intention was to get into this, but we talked about teenagers in the martial arts, and it was about an hour long, and, and we batted some stuff back and forth, and the feedback from that episode was pretty good. People writing in saying, yes, I found that some of the th- your ideas do work, or I'm going to try this, or whatever. So we'll link that in the show notes uh, for anybody that might be new, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find the show notes, and, and I'll make sure we get the the other episode that you and I did recently as well as the other stuff that we talk about but yeah that that was fun because we we just kind of sat there and and batted it back and forth and you know i i I have limited experience running a school you know i did it for a couple years but because of whistlekick i've traveled around a lot and i've been part of a lot of schools on my own and visited a lot of schools and i see a lot of the things that work well and a lot of the things that really you know don't seem to work well and uh one of the things that is interesting is that there's no one right answer to that problem. Yeah. So, and that, that's how I feel about teaching right. styles uh, too. Uh, you know, it's not one right. Cause I know some people are very, you know, strict and, and they still beat you with the uh, sticks. If you don't bend your knees enough or stuff like that. And there's some that, you know, kind of looks like a playground and there's some that do a, you know, combination of both. So yeah, just like with the uh, teaching styles, I feel like, you know, whatever fits your personality. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. There are different styles and different ways of teaching those styles because people themselves are different. And, you know, for anyone that says it should always be a certain way, well, that's to say that all people should be a certain way. And I don't want to live in a world that has a bunch of robots where everybody's yeah. exactly <laughs> the same. Yeah. Well, now we've got some context. We know a bit about who you are and mm. where you started and why and, and everything. But let's let's switch it into story time. I've heard some of your stories, and, and I know you've got a lot more that I haven't heard, but of course the listeners haven't heard any. So I'd love for you to tell us, you know, let's say your favorite story from your martial arts time. Oh, favorite story has to be uh, meeting uh, our instructor, uh, Bill Superfoot Wallace. That, that's got to be, uh, hands down, you know, my, my number one experience uh, that I've had because... Um, you know, when I was, like I said, I got it in, I got back into it at, in middle school and, uh, back in the day, you know, black belt magazine was, was huge. I mean, it still is. It's probably like one of the only magazines that's kind of surviving the, the times now, but, um, you know, there used to be this, uh, big company called Panther Productions and they would, you know, have like a, you know, six page ad of full ads of, uh, their video lines. And I remember picking up, you know, his, his VHS is, you know, that's how I'm dating myself. His VHS is back in the day. And I actually used to have his picture up in the, in my, uh, middle school locker. And, uh, I told him that I didn't tell him that, you know, next to him, I had a, you know, picture of Beavis and Butthead also, but, um, yeah, I mean, probably just mean him. Cause I, I used to, you know, have all of his tapes and, and watch all of his fights. So, uh, me and him was, a you know, dream come true. Nice. Nice. And of course, you know, that's, that's how you and I have gotten to know each other through hanging out with him and, and being kind of the, the de facto younger crew in new England. Yeah. yeah. I, I say, <laughs> I, I, I say that sarcastically to, to some of the guys that are only a couple of years older than us, but yeah. <laughs> what are you, what are you doing when you're not training? What, what hobbies, what are you into? You well, mentioned used to be in weight training. Yeah, this, this might sound, uh, you know, maybe sad or maybe inspiring, however you want to look at it. But, you know, basically, I just spend my, my, my free times, uh, you know, training. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I really don't. I mean, 
um, you know, on the weekends, uh, cause I'm right now I'm a, you know, I'm a stay at home dad during the, the day and then I teach at night and then the weekends, uh, you know, if I'm not watching one of my kids, uh, you know, soccer games or, or basketball, I'm, I'm either out, uh, you know, going to different events, uh, like your event, which was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, that's how I spend my weekend. Like you just, you know, ask me, Oh, I got this thing going on the training day on a Saturday. I said, yeah, I got nothing else going on. You know what I mean? So, uh, I went up and, and that, that was just a, a really fun time. And, uh, I know I picked up the t-shirt, but, uh, you know, my wife always steals it. So I don't even think I was able to wear it once, but, uh, you know, that was, that was a really fun time. And, and that's kind of what I do, uh, you know, traveling there or going up to our other instructors place, uh, you know, Terry Dow, or, uh, you know, I go up to New York to train with, uh, Robert McEwen, who's a, uh, Aikido master. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of what I do with my free time is if I'm not hanging out with my family, I'm just, uh, you know, training or, or going to events centered around training. So like I said, that can either be sad or, or inspiring. I don't know. Well, there's certainly some dedication there and some, some reflection of how passionate you are about martial arts. Now you mentioned your, your wife and you do have a family and you are not the only one in your family that trains, are you? No. And that's actually, uh, how I, I met my, my wife was, uh, I was, I was training her kids, which I know it can be controversial, but I know you've had other people in the past, uh, that, that have been kind of in the same situation where, uh, you know, maybe not the most ethical thing or, or whatever, but you know, it, it worked out. So, uh, I can't complain. And yeah, she has, uh, you know, I have some step kids and, and they all train and, uh, they actually, everyone has their black belts and, uh, her first kid, who I started training, uh, she's basically my, my uke and my, uh, assistant when, you know, I got to be in the office taking care of phone calls or business, you know, she's out there teaching class and, and, and she goes out to all these events and helps me out. And, uh, actually last time she, she trained outside was, uh, with you at, uh, the training station doing, uh, a, a sparring, uh, lesson. Yeah. yeah she's, she's good. She's solid. Yeah. <laughs> She's got solid feet, and I mean that in both ways. <laughs> yeah, and she actually, uh, you know, she's a second degree now in, uh, under me in Taekwondo, and, and she got her black belt uh, under uh, Mr. Wallace uh, last symposium. So uh, she's no slouch there, and, and she spends a lot of her free time training because, uh, you know, I know I mentioned uh, Robert McEwen just like five minutes ago. Uh, he was a, a person I met uh, doing a seminar with Superfoot, and uh, he kind of liked my style, so said, oh, you can come up and train, uh, you know, at the advanced class every, you know, once a month on a Sunday. And then uh, I got in good with one of his students in Connecticut, and we started training. And then my stepdaughter, Danielle, started training. And so uh, me and her right now are in the middle of testing for our uh, purple belts under Aikido. So we're, we're still working. Mixing it up. Yep. It's good stuff. Yeah. All right. I'd love for you to tell us about a time where stuff didn't go well. You know, martial artists, we've, we've got this kind of unique toolkit that we can dip into. And I'd love for you to tell us how you, you handled something that was rough with um, martial arts, whether that be physically or, or you know, mentally. Yeah, on the, on the mental thing, uh, hopefully I'm answering this correctly because I, I have a couple of takes on this, is I know uh, for a while um, – you know, martial arts was kind of a, I was in a really big, um, uh, kind of plateau where, uh, my instructor at the time was just, uh, you know, kind of preoccupied with family stuff. And he kind of just, you know, he, he had a set of skills and, and that was it. And he wasn't really, you know, interested in teaching more or anything like that. So I kind of hit a level where I just stayed there and I was basically running the school at the time, you know, teaching, the six days a week and, um, you know, taking care of office stuff, teaching classes, this, that, and the third. And I mean, I gave back a lot and I was probably like five years straight of just teach, 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 teach without really learning, which, you know, made me, uh, you know, uh, pretty good at, at teaching. Cause you know, you don't, you can't teach for that long and without dealing with a uh, hundred different types of people. So, you know, how to deal with really aggressive people, how to deal with really shy people, you know, extroverts, introverts, uh, you know, you name it, uh, you know, autistic or Asperger's and everything. So, you know, that was a really, on the plus side, 
you know, my, my teaching, I kind of honed it in, but at the same time, you know, I just kind of, uh, just plateaued at, at a personal level for a long, long time. That's why, you know, maybe, you know, when people hear that I'm doing this, that, and the third, they say, Oh, wow, he's kind of overdoing it. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm making up for, for years of, of just kind of, uh, you know, doing the same thing day in and day out. And there's really no wrong way to answer any of these questions. They're all just yeah. jumping off points. But I do to have to say, talk, you, um, know you know, with the, you know, how it ha has helped me was that, uh, you know, training has always been there. And, you know, I've been doing it now for 21 years straight without taking a break. So, you know, I, it's been there with the goods and ups. Like, you know, I, I've had uh, best friends come and go, you know, girlfriends come and go, wives come and go, uh, parents come and go. You know, my dad died and I and, and when he, he was sick for a while with a, a brain tumor and, you know, it's very easy if ever you, you've dealt with a kind of, you know, big illnesses is to just dwell on it and, uh, you know, just start feeling sorry for yourself or the person that's happened to, or feel sorry about everything in general. But for me, I was always able to, when I was teaching, just kind of hit that switch and, you know, kind of take myself out of my own body for that hour, 45 minutes, whatever it is and just dedicate it to the students and, or me training and kind of, you know, get out of it. And then, you know, after class, then you can deal with, okay, I got to go back to the hospital. I got to do this on the third, but, you know, so, so training is, has always been that thing where, um, you know, it, it's really good at kind of getting me out of a slump or, uh, uh, you know, just, just a depressed time and just, all right, you know, help others or, or go to class and, uh, sweat it out. And then come back and think yeah. about it or whatever. Right. For sure. Now, we've talked a bit about some of the variety of people that you have around you that you've learned from, that are you are still learning from, the folks that you call your instructors. When you think about your philosophy of martial arts, your approach, who's been the most influential person on that? Uh, like I have to say, just... Uh... Influential, I, I just have to say, uh, you know, Superfoot because uh, just idolizing him as a as a teenager, and then uh, you know going to all these events, and um, the the funny thing is, like he's I don't think people really realize it's like he's just so knowledgeable. It's just it's ridiculous because uh, you know kind of how you mentioned how you you only you know uh, you know you ran a school for a little while, but. Um, you know, you were kind of downplaying it and, um, you know, super, I think, you know, when he was telling that story out in, uh, in, uh, Alabama, you know, I think he talked about how he ran a school for a little bit, like in his college days, or I'm not sure. I know that, that story went all over the place, but I think he mentioned how he had the like, school for a little bit or do you remember that? Or I, I, I do. Yeah. Um, that was, and, and I don't remember if it was that specific story, but I know that, um, Elvis came to him and said, I want you to open a school. And that's what ultimately got him. Yeah. And to so the, to... the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, he's given me, you know, uh, probably, you know, a, a ton of advice on just how to, to run a school, which you wouldn't think that, you know, a guy who maybe you would say never had a school or, or, you know, uh, 50 years ago, what it would be that, uh, you know, reliable to, to take advice from, but yeah, it's just crazy. In the last couple of years, you know, he says, you know, oh, maybe, you know, try this or I would do that. Or, uh, you know, this is the trend that, that he sees. Cause I mean, he goes all over the place. So, you know, he sees what works, what doesn't work, uh, you know, what makes school successful, what, you know, is there dooms or whatever. So, um, yeah, I would just say, even though, you know, I've only known him for a couple of years, uh, you know, it's that, just that influence, especially, I think, uh, you know, he caught me at a time where, um, you know, I'm always kind of up and down about the, the school because it's just a, you know, I, I really do miss the days of, of when you were just a martial art and all you had to do was just show up to class and do your best. <laughs> like those kind of innocent days of that. And then, you know, when it becomes a, a business and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of responsibility, it can take, you know, a lot of the, the fun out or the, um, you know, however you want to put it out of it. And it, it replaces it with all this other kind of headache stuff. Um, so I, I was kind of, you know, getting burnt out and, and, you know, when he came by, it just kind of lit that fire of, uh, you know, all right, this is, this is what I do. And, you know, how can I make it better? Hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah, he, he's incredibly knowledgeable, and I don't think there are too many people who... I, I'm, I'm going to make a claim that Sorry. there is probably no martial arts instructor today who gets more face time with more people. Yeah. The sheer number of people that he works with across a year. No, he's not working with them every week or every month. But just the number of people that he works with at seminars. I mean, he's he's doing well over 100 seminars in a year. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. You know, and, and an average of 40 to 50 people at each one. I mean, there, there's, you know, five to 10,000 people that he is physically working with across a year. So, yeah, he's he's a very smart man, and he's going to pick up a lot about what works for people and – and yeah, we're we're both pretty lucky, and you certainly are are smart for taking this advice. That's for sure. Yeah, and I, um, you know, it's it's and it always comes kind of out of nowhere. Where you know, I you know, it's just funny how um, you know, just just kind of like these nuggets just fall out, and you know, it's uh, it's it's very interesting and, and fun. So yeah, yeah. If you had the chance to train with somebody else, somebody that you've never trained with, and will even let you train with dead people, who would you <laughs> want to train with? Dead people. Um, to be honest, I was actually really bummed that uh, I wasn't able to train with uh, Benny the Jet because he, he's one where, um, you know, I, I remember uh, my old man used to take me to, to Chinatown in Boston and we get like the bootleg martial arts movies because back when I was a teenager, it wasn't like the big market is now with uh jet Lee and, and, uh, you know, Jackie Chan was just kind of getting popular, but you know, it really wasn't a kind of a mainstream thing. So, you know, we'd go there, there was a, there was a spot in new London. We'd go to, and I pick up, uh, you know, like these, these VHSs and stuff. And, and I remember, you know, two of my favorite movies were that Mules on wheels and dragons forever by Jackie Chan. And, you know, Benny the jet was the, the main bad guy in both of them. And those fight scenes were just probably, you know, two of the best and uh you know he was there a couple weekends ago but uh me and you were uh, uh, preoccupied so i know we watched it but i kind of wanted to jump in and and you know train with him but i I didn't get a chance to Mm. yeah he's certainly a legend in in his own right and you know listeners here on the show we, we we talk about a lot of different stuff we talk about a lot of different people and one of the things one of the most fun things for me and it was only about 10 seconds long from that event down in atlantic city a few weeks ago was watching the interaction between mr wallace and and mr urquidez you know bill yeah, wallace was, and benny the jet have yeah. known each other for decades and so you know there, there's there's one group of us kind of going down the escalator and one getting ready to go back up the escalator and the two of them just start talking you know and 30 40 people around but in that moment you just saw the mutual respect and friendship of two people that have lived similar lives for decades. And I think there there's an understanding of someone else that comes when you've done that. And so for me, just getting to watch the two of them just have a real quick chat. And they weren't talking about anything substantial. They were yeah. kind of, you know, teasing each other the way you or I would tease each other. Yeah. But there was there was a different quality to it. And for me, that was certainly a highlight. Yeah, that, that was. I, I, I remember the exact point uh, that you that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was special to watch. Kind of like the just the looks on their faces towards each other. There was a deep, you know, admiration and, and respect that uh, you know you don't you don't really see that much nowadays. <laughs> no. no. Well, people don't tend to have known each other for for that long. You yeah, know, we, we live in a different world. People move around. They don't dedicate their lives to one thing as often as they, they once did. Yeah. We just spent some, you know, we, we've been talking a lot today about people that made their bones on competition and, and being great in the ring. What's your history with competition? Uh, yeah, that, that was one thing where it, it used to be kind of a sore subject. Cause I used to feel like, uh, you ever watch that movie on the waterfront with, uh, Marlon Brando no. with that whole, uh, you know, no. I could have been a contender type thing. Cause you know, okay. Is that, um, is that where that line's from? Yeah. 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 So, uh, basically like I came from a, a very kind of closed off organization where it was like three schools 
Uh, it was started at two and then three, and but they only did stuff uh, with their own people, I guess. So, um, you know, I got to a certain age when I was like 17 or 18 where, you know, I, I kind of shot up in, in height and, and my skills were pretty good. So, um, you know, no one wanted to, to, to spar me. And, and my, my thing was that, that was my favorite thing in, in competitions. Like, I mean, it's all good forms and breaking and, and, but I, you know, I, I always had some kind of weird, uh, you know, love for sparring because, um, you know, I guess with forms, it's very subjective. You can say, Oh, well, this person had better breathing or that person had better stance, but you know, if you're in a fight or a sparring, you know, you know, pretty, pretty much who won and who didn't. Uh, so I kind of like that aspect a little bit, but just, the the thing about, you know, when you, when you got a, you know, people trying to, you know, throw kicks at your full speed, you know, it really takes your, your awareness to, to right there at that exact moment where you're not thinking about, you know, oh, what, what TV show am I going to watch tonight? Or, you know, what am I going to have for dinner? You know, you're just thinking about, all right, how, how can I not get my head taken off? Because, uh, you know, one story I like to say was the the last time I competed in like a pretty big tournament, uh, I was, I was, uh, against someone who, uh, was probably training 10 more years than me. We were like the same age, but he was probably one that trained since he was like five. And, um, I don't know, he only came up to about, you know, my shoulder. So I, I, I had the height advantage, but, you know, the referee said go. And I, I blinked at the wrong time and I got kicked right in the nose. And still, you could probably see it. It's uh, a little bit off centered. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking like, wow, I just blinked at the wrong time. I, you know, I better not have any thoughts that are outside of what's going on right now. And, you know, not many things that I think people can do in the daily life that they have that same kind of focus and concentration that you can get from, from sparring. So, um, you know, sparring is my favorite, but unfortunately, because I was in an organization that was just, you know, very closed, no one wanted to, to, to spar me. So I, I went, you know, all through my twenties, uh, you know, not, not sparring. And then, you know, now, uh, you know, linking up with, with, uh, master Terry Dow and he has fight nights at his, uh, at his school that I know me and you went to and, and checked out, which was a awesome time. Um, you know, so I am thinking about dipping my feet back in there. It's just, you know, kind of tough if, you, you know, people talk about ring rust, if I've, you know, got ring rust for 15 years or whatever, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, kind of tough to to get back in the on the saddle but uh yeah something that i haven't ruled out so you know i might i might jump in the ring or one of these days hmm what it what's your i guess approach to competition in your school is is that something you encourage your students discourage your students you're indifferent to it like well i think there, there may be some insight there yeah uh since my upbringing you know it was only one tournament a year which you know, means that it, it, there, it, there wasn't really a big focus on it. And then, like I said, that for, you know, years and years and years, I, I couldn't even compete. So I kind of, you know, put a sour taste in my mouth about competitions because I would see all these people having fun and, and doing their thing. And uh, I'm over here just, you know, judging or, or being a ringleader or, a, um, you know, what have you, giving out medals. And so, uh, you know, it was very frustrating. But um, now – you know, I just kind of keep my ear open and, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, an instructor that me and you train without in Cromwell when we train with, uh, Christine Bannon Rodriguez, um, that instructor there, Frank, is, I'm, I'm really bad with lame. So I apologize. Um, uh, Shabietsky or, uh, anyways, he's having a tournament actually this Saturday that I've been trying to get my, my, my crew prep for, which, um, what I like is that it's different. It's not a uh, WTF style, which is what I've been doing for years. And then the last few years I've been doing kind of kickboxing, but now I've, I've been uh, incorporating point fighting, which is, uh, you know, very different. And, uh, but, you know, I've been just having fun uh, learning, you know, the, the point fighting rules and kind of their strategies. Uh, Cause as you know, like, you know, things can have a common, uh, similarities, but there, there are, you know, some big differences that, uh, make it interesting. And, and, you know, I, I've just been enjoying, uh, learning the different types of, of sparring. So, um, mm. yeah, I just been kind of keeping the ear out. We basically, my school averages maybe once a year, but, um, you know, uh, I kind of leave it up to the, the students. I don't pressure them. It's, uh, you know, I think sometimes they say, all right, if you're a certain belt, you need to do, you know, this, this every year, whether it's two tournaments or whatever, but I'm kind of more, you know, if they want to, that's great. If not, 
uh, that's fine because I definitely see the benefits of it. And I think you've done whole issues of, uh, you know, the benefits of tournaments. But at the same time, I, I've had it where it backfired where, you know, people have bad experiences and they just stop training because they think that's what the, you know, what training is about. And it's not it just one day out of your life. But, you know, some people, they take it serious and they, you know, go on to something else. Hmm. Yeah, if it was cut and dry, it wouldn't be a controversial subject. Yeah, and you know, yeah, basically, uh, you know, when, when it, doing different styles, I'm just telling my crew right now, just just have some fun with it, and you know, try and learn something because, you know, whenever you leave it to the judges, or or maybe there's a rule that you know they know more about that we don't, or whatever, like you know, don't don't get too kind of caught up with the, the um, you know, the the, the results, but just the, the experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about movies. You know, okay. you've mentioned some movies, and I know personally that you're into martial arts movies. Yeah. What are your favorites? Yeah, my favorites like those, uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s Jackie Chan uh, films. Um, you know, I was big in the, the Jet Li. He had that one, Fist of Legend, which I remember seeing that, like that, you know, the fight scenes in that, and I, you know, dropped my jaw. And, of of, of course, you know, the, the Force of One, with our boy in it and uh, Chuck Norris, that that one's a classic. Um, and then I, I think for now, just uh, it's always fun watching like the Michael Jai White movies and you know spotting when he does the you know super foot moves or, or techniques uh, like that. Uh, what was that Blood and Bone? That one was just an awesome movie uh, with the choreographing and everything. So um, yeah, I think uh, you know for back in the day it was you know Jackie Chan and Jet Li. Now it's probably uh, you know Michael Jai White and Tony Ja, even though he he hasn't done too much lately, but he's always uh, entertaining fight scenes to watch. Yeah, I I hope that something happens and we see more of Tony Ja. Yeah, we, we need we need him. I will say. Yeah, I remember I was talking to one of your your past guests, uh, Grant Campbell. And he was a big fan of uh, uh, John Wick uh, number two. He said they had uh, good fight scenes in that, which I haven't seen yet, but. I know that was one that, that he recommended for me, so I'll have to check it. I'm not sure if you saw that one yet, but he said that was a good one. Yeah, it, it, it's it's fantastic. I mean, there, it, yeah, it, it's funny to to look at Keanu Reeves now, you know, John Wick, and and there was just uh, a commercial that popped up on TV that I saw over the weekend. He was standing on a motorcycle. Oh <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was like the yeah, right? Yeah, from the and, Super Bowl, and, and I think. So, yeah. yeah, and. And then to think of Keanu Reeves 20 years ago, you know, when he was doing movies like Speed. Yeah, or Bill or Ted's uh, Excellent you know, Adventure. Just, <laughs> yeah, and just, you know, just being a, a, a goofball and just watching how he's become a, a bit more of a, a serious and talented actor. And then they gave him such incredible fight scenes. I don't know how much of that stunt work, that action work he was doing himself. Yeah. But it's convincing and it's completely changed my perspective, whether it's John Wick one or two, they're both fantastic movies and, and you almost have to classify them as martial arts movies. Cause there's so much action, so much combat going on. Yeah, definitely. I actually just saw black Panther last night and the, the fight scenes in there. Phenomenal. Oh yeah. Hey, did you ever finish that? Yeah, absolutely uh, phenomenal. That Thor movie? I know me and you like watched no. half of it. And, no, uh, no, <laughs> no, yeah. no. Uh, what, what, what he, Mr. Milholland is is referencing everyone is that when we were in Atlantic City we tried watching the new Thor movie and it was uh, it was too goofy and yeah too much like Guardians of the Galaxy they uh, kind of yeah, yeah yeah but but not done well so yeah. if anybody out there really loved that movie I'm sorry uh, I didn't I might try it again but I do have to say yeah. uh, I know you always ask about movies but uh, one thing which I which I, I like to mention is that uh, you know I used to watch a lot of TV. I mean, I still do, but I used to too. <laughs> that was a Mitch Hedberg joke. <laughs> All right, but anyways, uh, what I liked was uh, this show called WMAC Masters, which I'm not sure if you yeah. knew about or not, but that's why, uh, you know, when we met Christine Bannon Rodriguez, you know, that was, that was an awesome time because she was in that show. And it was like a scripted kind of kid's show where it was they'd have uh, fights and then like a moral to the story. And it's it's a great thing. And the, the thing that, that kind of thinks about is that it hasn't been released on dvds but it's a show that i kind of you know want to introduce my, my stepkids to because they're around that age 9 10 11 i think you know it's perfect for them um and i know she's having a tournament up in april where it says it's going to be a wmac master reunion which um i might be away for that but i'm hoping that i can maybe 
I come up a day and then just check those out. Cause those are people that I used to watch, you know, when I was, uh, you know, pretty young. Uh, and, and, and that was one of my favorite shows. So I know it's not a movie, but that was a, a martial arts, uh, TV show that, that I used to watch like religiously back in the day. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when you, when you look at that show and the number of impressive people that were on that show, just for kind of the way the world saw martial arts and the fact that it was on TV, I mean, no, it wasn't huge budget or anything, but yeah, you know, it's pretty impressive. Obviously would have liked to have seen more seasons of it, but maybe, maybe something like that'll pop up again. Yeah. I'm, you think they would have by now, but I was, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, I'm not, I'm not too sure what kind of kids have nowadays for their kind of martial arts outlet. I know, uh, you know, Ninjago is a big thing, but I don't know how good the fight scenes are in that if they're Lego people, but you know, I know, I know that's kind of like the new thing. Right. How about books? You've mentioned a few books as we've talked today. Are there books that, excuse me, you would recommend to the listeners? You think, you know, everybody should read this one or this, these two. Yeah. If I had to pick one for, for everyone, and, and this is just great. Cause this is a, a thing that, you know, probably 90% of martial arts schools either don't talk about, or if they do, it's, uh, you know, very kind of piece by piece and not really a big picture is, uh, like the law and fighting. And, uh, you know, probably the first seminar that I went to that wasn't, uh, someone I was affiliated with was, uh, Rory Miller. He was doing a thing up in Boston about, uh, martial arts and the law. And, uh, just a few years before that, I, I got in, in a little trouble, uh, getting into a little scuffle. And so it, it was something that, you know, personally was, a, um, you know, uh, kind of resonated with me and I, I never heard of him before. I just saw the title about, you know, the law and martial arts. And I was like, well, I got to check this out. And then when I met him, uh, you know, I was just like, wow, this is, this is way better than I thought. I thought it was just going to be, you know, kind of, a um, you know, maybe like a two hour seminar that I would take a couple of notes and that was it. But, you know, it really introduced me to him and his, his philosophy. And, and, uh, you know, he had a couple books that I just picked up right on the spot, the meditations on violence and, uh, uh, the, the other one, cause his first two were like probably like classics. I know like since then he's gained a lot of popularity and has come out with a, you know, a book every year or, or, or so, but, um, yeah, those first two are just, you know, I, I think those are must reads. Uh, cause it, it really tells you on how to, you know, one spot violence. So you don't even get caught up into it. Cause you know, I think he mentions that, uh, you know, most of the violence is the, uh, you know, social violence, not, uh, predatory violence. So, you know, if, if someone's pushing you, you know, no getting that, you know, what he calls a monkey dance. And, uh, you know, if you do happen to get in trouble, how you can articulate it. So, uh, you know, you don't have to spend the next year and a half in and out of court, uh, you know, explaining to yourself. So yeah, those, those Rory Miller is uh, probably one because it doesn't matter what style you're in, whether it's Kung Fu or karate, Taekwondo, whatever it's, you know, it's going to help you. Mm, for sure. And of course, Rory Miller has been on the show. It was absolutely wonderful, wonderful episode. One of my favorites. Yeah. To be honest, because it, it just, I felt like we got um, so much more, context for what he writes about it just it gave me a much deeper understanding for his lessons yeah and and the fact that he's very uh you know there, there's no ego involved like they, he, he's not one uh because i'm not i don't know i'm not trying to blow up any spots but you know we, we've seen people where you know you see him walk down the hall and they have like the most elegant uniform on with 500 patches and they have 18 <laughs> titles to their name and they're, they're really built up and you know the thing about him was when i met him he was, you know, not what you would think of a, you know, a, probably like a, you know, he's not like a movie star in martial arts, but I'm saying he's no, uh, you know, kind of Van Damme or anything like that. He's like, you know, just short and low, low pudgy. And, and I mean, he's just amazing, but like, there's no ego there. And, and, and what I like about him was that, you know, he says that, you know, he, he's not trying to create a, you know, mini him. He wants you to do your own thing. And, and I think, you know, that's why I really enjoy you know, listen to him speak or, or Mr. Wallace. Cause you know, they, they don't want you to be, you know, many of them. They want you to, you know, take what they do and, and make it your own, which, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's the correct way on, or how I look at it. Hmm. Let's keep any going. 
goals? You know, is, is there stuff that you're looking out into the future and saying, you know, this is important to me or not? Well, my we, goal we've had, we've yeah, had for, for here is just to, to, to get my, uh, my school growing. Cause unfortunately I didn't know this till after I opened up. I thought I did my research. I didn't that well, I guess, but, uh, there's a lot of competition out there. So, um, you know, it was very hard for me because for like the first, you know, three, four years at the school, I was just, all right, I'm doing uh, strictly TKD. And it's very tough when, you know, you got a white dude teaching a, a Korean martial art when, you know, down the street, there's a Korean teaching Taekwondo. So it's, you know, nine out of 10 would probably say, all right, I'll go to the, 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 the source. You know, even though it doesn't depend on the skill or anything, it's just, oh, Taekwondo's from Korea. There's a Korean guy down the street. Let's go check that out. So, um, you know, I've been kind of uh, just kind of broadening out and, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot more just self-defense orientated drills that, you know, I picked up from uh, Robert McEwen, uh, who does a NGA, Nihon Goshen type style of Aikido, which is more, I guess you would say, you know, combative or realistic than maybe your traditional O-sensei style. Because I know it's it's actually not from that instructor. It's like an offshoot, which is. You know, the, like he said, it makes up 1% of like the Aikido community, but, um, you know, it's very kind of down to earth and just practical and, um, you know, street ready kind of right off the bat without, uh, you know, too much flowery stuff. But, um, yeah, I've been doing kind of that just as a more, um, you know, adding self-defense because, you know, I, I always, you know, remember my roots and, and my number one reason for training was to, to, to stay safe and, uh, years ago too, I, I was, uh, happened to be a bouncer at this like really bad bar and you know, the, the owner said, all right, I don't want you to do any punching or kicking to p- keep people out. So, you know, kind of offshoot that I, uh, was studying in Boston, uh, with some chin on like white crane stuff. Um, actually the affiliates of that Y W M A A, uh, yeah. um, production, which I know they're, they're huge. And that school out there, I think yeah. the instructor's name was Ben Warner. Yeah, he was, he was a, it was a blast working out with him. I don't do that now because I have the Aikido, but, you know, I, I always wanted to pick something up because, um, you know, I mentioned in our, our conversation that you taped a couple of weeks ago about, you know, different ranges. And, yeah, from outside range, you know, I got all the tools I need, but you get into the forehead-to-forehead range, you know, that's what I picked up the kind of chin-na stuff for. And then, like, I gave a shout-out to your boy, uh, you know, Richard Hubbard last time, he does that, like the elbow to elbow. So I think what keeps me going is just trying to be, you know, more well-rounded um, and just, just give people, uh, you know, uh, more stuff to to put in their toolbox. You know, it, it's tough because, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, people that like play Pokemon about, you know, collect them all. I'm not a, you know, a, a technique hoarder, but, you know, I, I definitely want people to be prepared. So, you know, if, if all you do is, is, uh, you know, stuff from, uh, one range and not, not others. And I, I think you're doing a disservice. So that's why I've been kind of picking up, you know, stuff from here, here and there to, um, kind of throw in. Cause one thing that I was surprised about was last year when we went to, you know, uh, mobile Alabama or I don't know how do I, I, I know I was pronouncing it wrong, but Mo- mobile, mobile, mobile. <laughs> but mobile. you know, we did a lot of wrestling there. And when I go to the karate colleges, um, with, with Superfoot, I, I like to train with uh, Mark Hatmaker, who does a lot of Western style boxing and and, and wrestling. And um, you know that was something I never did in high school, but I never realized like how much fun that is. So I, I've been just doing uh, you know more more wrestling stuff in my class. And you know I don't I don't claim to be an expert or whatever, but you know I just like to throw kind of different stuff at people because you know some people really gravitate to that. Some people say, "Wow, well, I would never want to get that close," and that's fine. But you know at least I kind of open their eyes to you know, what's out there. If people want to get a hold of you, you know, what, what, where, where can they find you? How can they reach you? You know, feedback or, you know, maybe they're, they're near West Hartford and, and they want to pop by or something. Oh yeah. My, my door is always open. Uh, we just moved, uh, to 121 Talkit uh, road, West Hartford. Um, I do have a website, the G T G T tkd.com um and you know I, my phone number 860-933-5232 and uh yeah i mean if it's you know even if you just want to pop in and and just train for a night you know uh 
life's kind of all about experiences. So yeah, just come do or if you're serious, train uh, for longer time. That's that's fine too. Um, but yeah, those are probably like the best ways to to get in contact. Okay. Yeah, and of course we'll we'll link the website. Yeah. From the show notes and some final words. Send us out. Final words. Um, it's not about style. It's about your the instructor because. You know, uh, people ask me all the time, oh, what, what, what do you think, that you, what's the best style or this or that? Or I, I heard, you know, BJJ is better than this. Or I heard, you know, Krama guys like this. And or I heard, uh, you know, uh, Kaiko Shin Karate, this, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, I just tell people it's about the instructor. And, uh, you know, find who, you, who you're compatible with. And, uh, you know, because like I, I told you about my philosophy about how um, – you know, I'm not really, even though I come from a very old school, you know, hit them over the head if they're doing stuff wrong. That's not how I do it. And I think that's another reason why, you know, I try and spend as much time with, uh, you know, Mr. Wallace as I can because, um, you know, when I went to college, I was a philosophy major. And uh, a philosopher that I'm really into is a guy named Alan Watts. And uh, he always talks about, you know, don't, don't think of work as work. You know, think of it as play. And, you know, how many times have you heard Superfoot say, you know, play with the techniques and, Mm -hmm. you know, figure it out. And, you know, I I think that's why, you know, I I really gravitate towards him is because, you know, his philosophy and and how he interacts with students and, you know, how he how he still training probably is, you know, as as hard as he did. Well, maybe not as hard, but, you know, he's still constantly trying to improve. And, you know, how many times have we seen instructors that are you know, half his age and they got a belly out to their knees and, you know, their training days are over. They just point their finger and say, Oh, you know, do this, do that. But, um, yeah. So, you know, uh, definitely if you're looking for a school, you know, go to, go to more than one and, and see, you know, uh, who's and you know, instructor you're more compatible with or, or whose style you like the best. What don't go by, you know, Oh, I heard in a Facebook article that, uh, you know, Taekwondo is the best. I'm going to do that because uh, I don't think that's the way to go. To be perfectly honest, if it wasn't for this show, my friendship with Mr. Mulholland never would have happened. It was because of my connection to Bill Wallace and ultimately Sensei Terry Dow that I met Mr. Mulholland and we became training partners and then we became friends and we've spent some time together and he's a great guy and I appreciate our friendship, I appreciate the way that he pushes me in our training. And it's a pleasure for me to bring you an episode with someone that I get to interact with in that way. Because most of the people that we have on the show, I don't know well. Some of them I know personally, but I really can't call them friends in the way that I can say, Paul Milholland is my friend. So thank you for being on the show. I appreciate your time. And I look forward to the next time we get to hang out, whether it's training or taking a long car ride to some more fun. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got some photos over there. We've got links. We've got 269 other episodes. There's just a ton of great stuff there. Sign up for the newsletter. And that's that's it. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.